Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Psalm 119, the letter Pay, beginning at verse 129. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore does my soul keep them. The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me, as thou usedest to do unto those that love your name. Order my steps in your word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep your precepts. Make your face to shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. Rivers of waters run down my eyes, because they keep not your law. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be the Lord Jesus Christ. Merciful Heavenly Father, the maker of heaven and earth, the great I am. We thank you, King of Israel, King Jesus. We thank you for this day that you have made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And as we rejoice and worship your holy and righteous name, we thank you for ordering our steps in your word. We thank you for keeping us from all iniquity so that iniquity will not be our ruin. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the incorruptible seed through the new birth so that the Holy Spirit will live and move and have his being in our earthen vessels of clay as we deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow you. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will pour out more grace, for you give grace unto the humble, but you resist the proud. And so we thank you, Lord, that as we decrease so that you can increase, that you continue to fill us up because our mouths are open wide unto you and we pan after you as the deer pants by the rivers of water to be satiated with the fountain of life, to be satiated with this everlasting flow of living water that pours out in abundance from your throne. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to have access to come boldly before your throne, to drink as we bow and worship at your feet, and say, Hallelujah, King Jesus, you live forever. We thank you, Lord, that you look upon us and that you extend mercy unto us and that you always cause your face to shine upon us and you continue to teach us your ways because you have showed us the good way and we are now walking in it, this narrow road that only a few people find. And we praise you, King Jesus, for keeping us in your hands. You have snatched us out of the fire and you have brought us into your marvelous light. We thank you for this new life that we have in you. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And so now, Lord God, we pray for this fresh and new anointing that you are pouring out. We pray that you would do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. As you lead us and guide us into all truth, as you continue to open up the scriptures unto your servants, so that we can study to show ourselves approved, so that Whenever somebody comes our way through divine appointment, as you orchestrate everything, we would always have a reason for the hope that is in us because it is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Because the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me because we have been identified in your death, burial, and resurrection. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking words of life because we have the power of life and death in our tongues and we choose life because you have come to give us life and life more abundantly so may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight O oh lord our strength and our redeemer may our words be filled with grace seasoned with salt and may we always declare what thus saith the lord because we are not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to the jew first and also to the gentile Lord God, lead your people here to eat at this table that you have prepared. May our minds be stayed on you so that you keep us in perfect peace. May our minds be open to receive what thus saith the Lord. May our hearts be open to receive what thus saith the Lord, the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. May our ears and our eyes be open to see and to taste and to hear because faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And we want to taste, O Lord, because you are good, because we have set our seal to this, that you, King Jesus, you are true. We have the whole armor of God on, Lord Jesus Christ. Sharpen our sword, for iron sharpens iron. So sharpen us with your word right now and build us up in the inner man with your everlasting word that is forever settled in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be sharpened. And we pray for the peace of Yerushalayim. In the name above all names, we pray and ask it all, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. Well, hallelujah, saints of God. It's so good to be back with another teaching installment of when the temple in heaven is opened. Everything will change. And praise King Jesus. Amen. We just got to praise him. Hallelujah. <laughs> right. When all else fails, right, when we're left to our own devices, we continue to stand upon the solid rock and praise his name. Amen. His praise shall continually be in our mouths. Right. Because there's no one else worthy of praise. There's no one else worthy of our adoration. There's no one else worthy of saying hallelujah to because that is the highest praise. And we exalt King Jesus forever and ever. If we ain't got nothing to say. We got one thing to say. Praise King Jesus forever. Amen. <laughs> right. And so I'm thankful that. He has given us tongues to declare what thus saith the Lord and to rejoice in his holiness because he has done it. Amen. He has given us the victory. And because he has given us the victory, right, because of his shed precious blood that we have placed all of our faith in, right, we are, we are identified in his death. We are crucified with Christ. Amen. We were buried with him in baptism. Amen. We were, we were identified in everything that he came to accomplish because he finished the work. Hence why he cried out on the cross. It is finished because we have been identified with him and we have been raised with him the newness of life. All we can say when we ain't got nothing to say is praise King Jesus forever. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we always have a word of hope. Amen. We always have words of life. Amen. We always have something to say because when all else fails, the only thing that we can say, Jesus Christ lives forever. Amen. Do you know? <laughs> That's why it's such a, pro a, a privilege, right? It, it's such a privilege to uh, be ambassadors for his namesake, right? To be ministers of reconciliation. Right to be sent out on duty as watchmen and women on the wall, right, giving him no rest day or night until he makes Jerusalem a praise in all the earth, amen. And because we have such an awesome responsibility, right, to fulfill the great commission to go out into all the world, right, declaring what thus saith the Lord, preaching the gospel to every creature under heaven, right, telling them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded us, right? Because we have this awesome privilege to be his hands and his feet so that he could use our mouth to speak what thus saith the Lord, because we have this awesome privilege. It's a joy, child of God, to talk about Jesus, amen? I'm always meditating. Right? I'm always meditating on the goodness of Jesus because uh, this world, right, this world is something else. This world is something else, as you well know, right? <laughs> this world is, is something else. And, and because this world is something else, we know that it's not our home, amen? We're, we're pilgrims, we're strangers, right? We're foreigners, we're, we're just passing through, right? We're on a journey, amen? And, and the journey is almost over, hallelujah. We know that we're on the cusp of everything changing, amen? We know that the transition is about to take place. Amen. And so as we continue to pass through this world on our destination to the Father's house, the more and more we are allowed to live on his green earth in uh, these bodies that we have currently, the more we see that this world is, is, is just, it's just so rotten, right? It's just so rotten. This world is just so rotten. That's why 
We are in the world, but we are not of the world. That's why the world hates us, right? Because if we were of the world, the world would love its own. But because we are not of the world, the world hates us, right? That's why the world is our enemy. Mm. And not only that, even our life, right? Our flesh, mm. right? The more we grow in the things of God, the more we see how corrupt we are and our sinful nature, right? In our flesh dwells no good thing. The, more, the, the closer that we draw to Christ, amen, right? Because we're growing in faith. We're growing in wisdom. We're growing in stature through the inner man because of the incorruptible seed. The more that we see how this old nature is just so vile, right? That's why God said, unless we hate our life, we cannot be his disciple. And my goodness, I hate my flesh, mm. right? I hate my flesh right? because the flesh wants to do what the flesh wants to do. And it's so wicked and despicable, this whole nature that we have. Okay. There's no redeeming qualities in our flesh, right? That's why flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's the spirit that gives life. God has given us an incorruptible seed, given us the Holy Spirit. And because we have the Holy Spirit, God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, his spirit confers with our spirit that we are children of God. That's why we are waiting for that new body, mm. right? We're waiting for the new wine to be put in the new wine skin, amen? <laughs> right, this old flesh, man, is something else. Right, the world, the flesh, and then you know, it's the three-headed monster. Here comes, here comes old Slewfoot. Right, here comes old Slewfoot, a uh, fan in the flame. Right, and and he's relentless. You know how he do. Right, you know how the crooked serpent do, and and and, and he's relentless in his attacks. Right, day after day, moment after moment, hour after hour, minute after minute, here he come. Right, in order to goad us. Right. With the world, which he is the little G God of. Right. He's the God of this world in, in order to tempt our fallen nature, our sinful flesh in, in, in order to knock us off our pivot. Right. To make us ineffective for the kingdom of God. Right. To get us down and discouraged. Right. He wants to steal, kill and destroy our testimony, our witness. Right. He wants to destroy everything that God has made. Right. Because he is the destroyer. Mm. But praise be to God that greater is he that is in us, amen, than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. That's why, as the psalmist says, our, our eyes run down with rivers of waters. Our, our eyes are teary because we see the oppression in the world and how people hate God. There is no fear of God in their eyes. And because we weep for these people, right? we weep for these people, we weep that they're in the clutches of the wicked one. We weep that they're so blinded to the truth. We weep that they have so much hatred in their heart. We weep that they're on their way to hell and uh, most of them don't even know it and the other uh, people don't even care, right? Because they think that hell is some type of party, right? That they're gonna be yupping it up forever with all their friends in a fiery lake. Come on now. I mean, how deceived can you be? Right? You talk about deception. <laughs> You got these people out here, oh, well, all my friends are going to be in hell, so I'm going to be with him. I'm going to have a good time in the, in the fiery flame. Okay, come on. You talk about deception. I want, I want to see you have fun in a burning house. I want to see you light your house on fire, and I want to see you have a party in a flaming house. Let me know how that goes. Come on. You talk about deception. Mm. Right? But these people are so deceived, right? They're so deceived by their flesh, they're deceived by the world, and they're deceived by the dragon, the three-headed monster. And so praise be to God, amen. We're going somewhere with this child of God. Just want to encourage you for a moment. But praise be to God that we have one another because we are in the body of Christ. And because we can pray for one another, we have fellowship and agreement because we're walking together and we're lifting each other up before the Father and we're girding each other up because we are in this together forever, knowing that Jesus Christ, the head, the one to whom we belong, will never leave us nor forsake us. And no matter what we go through in this life, no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what the flesh may be tempted by, no matter what the devil and his fiery arrows may uh, come out 
against us. We know that a thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it will not come near us. Mm, right? We have a solid foundation, amen? And the solid foundation is a person. He is the God man, Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Do you know him, child of God? Amen. <laughs> have you acquainted yourself with him and been at peace so that you can have rest for your soul? He is the Prince of Peace. Do you know him, child of God? Have you acquainted yourself with him? Have you become familiar with the sinless Lamb of God? Have you entered into covenant mm, right, with the one who paid it all? Have you sat down at the table? Mm. even in the midst of your enemies and had a fellowship meal with the Son of God. Have you done it? Do you know him? That's the question. <laughs> you see, because his sheep hear his voice and he knows us and we follow him and he gives us eternal life and we will never perish. Neither can anyone snatch us out of his hands. So keep the faith, child of God. Keep pushing. Keep marching. Hold on, old soldier. Right? Because we're fighting a good fight. Amen. We know that at the revelation of the Son of Man, everything that we are enduring, right, will be worth it because our light afflictions, which are for a moment, is nothing to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed on the cloudy and dark day. <laughs> when all of us who are in Christ, the table of showbread and the menorah, are caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's why we have to continually comfort one another with these words. And this is the segue to the teaching. Amen. Because we are to continually comfort one another with these words, I want to paint the picture through the power of the Holy Spirit with this next part of the series of prophesied titled The Visions of God. Hmm. Prophesy the visions of God. Amen. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, I want the Holy Spirit through the anointing that overflows, which destroys the yoke. I want this picture to be painted about the visions of God. Amen. <laughs> And this is a beautiful, this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story that the Holy Spirit's going to paint. And so I don't know who God sends. Amen. And I'm thankful uh, that God has sent everybody that's listening to this teaching right now and the people that have been here for years, that God has blessed us to come together, to learn together and grow together in, in the faith. Amen. But for anybody out there that may be new, I got to set the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And how do we set the foundation, which is Jesus Christ? Well, we speak what thus saith the Lord. Amen. And because we're building upon the foundation, right, the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, the word of God, is going to be built upon with the word of God. And so we have to let down this foundation to understand the waters that we're going to be traveling over. Mm. Right. Because we're talking about the typologies. We're talking about the shadows. We're talking about the visions of God. And God is going to paint a marvelous picture for us, right? In order to encourage one another with these words, because he's going to show us everything that he's going to do before he does it, because this is what the Bible says. Amen. Amos chapter 3. Let's paint it, Holy Spirit. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely. The Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who will not prophesy? Mm. Welcome to this teaching series, Prophesy. <laughs> the Lord God has spoken. We have 66 books, mm. right? And God has equipped the church with the fivefold ministry. Right. He's blessed us with apostles and um, teachers and pastors. Right. He's he's equipped uh, the body of Christ for the edification of the saints with evangelists. Amen. Right. With uh, people who God has ordained right before the foundations of the world. <laughs> 
to build up his body with the truth of what thus saith the Lord. And so I want to show you, according to what God has showed us in the word, his secrets, mm, right? His secrets, because we're going to be looking at the visions of God. And so in order to understand everything that God is communicating with us, we have to understand the basics, which is Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10. Remember the form of things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Mm. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Do you believe what thus saith the Lord? That's the question. <laughs> the Lord God has spoken. Who cannot prophesy? Okay. Who can but prophesy? Okay. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. God is speaking. Amen. These are the very words of God. Amen. These are the very words of God that the Apostle Paul told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Mm. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. And so because we believe that God is true and everybody else is a liar. Amen. We need the spirit of God to take the things of God and make all of this real to us. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What are you allowing the Holy Spirit to hear if you have the incorruptible seed? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because whatever he hears, mm, that's what he's going to speak. Right. And he's going to show us things to come. Because the prophet Amos says, surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen. So what are you allowing the Holy Spirit to hear? Right? We have free will. Right? We have free will. We can choose to feast upon the word of God or we could choose not to. Right? And so that's how you know when you hear all these strange doctrines and theories. Right? You can tell that these people who come up with these strange doctrines and theories, they haven't been spending time with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to take the things of Christ and make them real to that person. Right. Because the Holy Spirit. Right. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, says in John chapter 16, verse 14, he shall glorify me. OK. You got people that want to deny God's glory and say there's no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. And you think these people are hearing from God in regards to eschatology when they deny the pre-tribulation rapture. OK. They're trying to rob God of his glory. So they're not speaking under the anointing. <laughs> OK. When they come to eschatology, they're not hearing from God, right? They've been hoodwinked, bamboozled, and led astray. God have mercy. Because the Holy Spirit is going to glorify Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ is revealed on the clouds, he's going to be glorified amongst his saints. Mm. Because he is going to call to the heavens above and to the earth beneath, according to Psalm chapter 50, right? And when he calls to the heavens above, Dead in Christ rise first, those who are absent from the body and present with the Lord. And when he calls to the earth beneath, those of us who are alive remain, right? He's going to say, gather them all together, every one of them that has made a covenant with him by sacrifice. Mm. You talk about glorifying the king of glory, okay? Everybody that has entered into the new covenant in his blood will be caught up at the revelation of the Son of Man, for he shall receive of mine. <laughs> Speaking of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 16, verse 14, and shall show it unto you. You see, the Holy Spirit is going to receive the word of God, and he, if we've been spending time with 
the word of God, Jesus Christ, because we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. We are walking in agreement because we are one in him. He's the head, we're the body. Because we've been spending time in the word of God, like you're doing right now, child of God. He's showing everything that he's going to do before he does it. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And so this is what we're doing, child of God. This is how we're encouraging one another with these words. Amen. We're relying on the Holy Spirit. Right? We believe that all scripture is God breathed. Amen. We understand that God has already told us everything that we have to know because he declares the end from the beginning. We know that he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets, before he does anything. And therefore, because we have fellowship with him, we call out to him, right? The Holy Spirit to teach us. Mm. Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Mm. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Well, that entails somebody that has a, a humble spirit, right? <laughs> All right, because a lot of people, they think that they know everything. They, they, they're, they're busy bodies, right? They don't want to sit at God's feet, right? They, they want to be busy bodies. They want to talk about everything else. And when they come to eschatology, which they have no understanding of, they're in complete error because they haven't been spending time with the master at his feet. They haven't been calling out to him, asking the Holy Spirit to show me these great and mighty things that I don't know. You know everything, King Jesus, so I need you to show me, Holy Spirit, right? And therefore, I'm going to spend time in the Word, studying to show myself approved, a work man and woman of God who needs not be ashamed, because you're going to rightly divide this. Amen. And therefore, I declare that God is true, because I've set my seal to this. Amen. <laughs> and so this is the foundation. Amen. The foundation is the Word of God. And so with this background information, because you as a Berean, and you're going to search to see if these things are so, and because you have a robust understanding with the full counsel of God, that's why God has led your feet here. Because you have been given the Holy Spirit, the incorruptible seed, and he has taken the things of Christ and making them real to you. You're going to be encouraged and built up in the faith as we study together to see about the visions of God. Amen. Prophesy! <laughs> the visions of God. Amen. Look at this picture that God paints. Amen. Look at this picture that God paints. So let's go to the E sword. Amen. We got 11 verses to go through. <laughs> we got 11 verses to go through. So remember, this whole series, Prophesy, is based upon the book of Ezekiel. Amen. And, you know, the last couple of months, we done did so many different series, but they're all, I mean, literally everything on this channel is, is all about eschatology, pretty much. Amen. Right. We're, we're, we're talking about the last days. Right. We're talking about the end of all things. We're talking about the transition. We're talking about when the temple in heaven is opened. Right. <laughs> right. When the heavens are open. Right. When that door is opened. Okay. Well, the vision is going to be a reality because everything is going to change. It's a guarantee. You see what they got pulling, pulled up their sleeve once again, right? Seven year anniversary of September 23rd, 2017. You see what they got planned at the UN and none other than Babylon the Great talking about peace and safety once again. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. When they shall say peace and safety, right? <laughs> and so we're seeing everything manifesting. Right. The day or the hour, me personally, I don't know. Right. The day or the hour when the doors to heaven are open, I don't know. If I did, I would say it. <laughs> right. With 100 percent, okay, boldness. But I just, I can, I, it's not in me to say, you know, it, it's going to happen on such and such day because I don't know. Right. I want to speak with authority. I want to speak with the anointing. I want the Holy Spirit to communicate. Right. And so. God has blessed me to be a blessing to you in order to bring very various parts of uh, his eschatological plan together so that we can digest it so that we could all be on the same page. 
right? To know what will happen when the doors to heaven are open and everything does change. And so with this series prophesied, we're going to be going through the book of Ezekiel. And today we're talking about the visions of God. Ezekiel chapter one, verse one. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibah, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Mm. So let's click on this word for visions. Amen. Let's click on this word for visions and let's go through this word, Mara, which means a vision, which is a mirror, looking glass. Right. So you know what a mirror is, a mirror, right? You stand in front of the mirror, it reflects right, the object that is in the mirror. Right. And so it's a picture. Right. It's a picture. God is giving a picture right, of what he's going to do before he does it. Amen. God is giving a picture of what he's going to do before he does it. It's a reflection. OK, Ezekiel was seeing a reflection of what's to come. Right? <laughs> and so I want to follow this word specifically that we find in Ezekiel chapter one. I want to follow the 11 occurrences of this word Mara to show you. The looking glass. Mm. I want to show you the reflection. <laughs> I want to show you the reflection through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So let's go through it. The first time this word is mentioned. Mm. It's in Genesis chapter 46, verse 2. And so this is going to be the template, right? This is going to be the law of first mention. So in Genesis chapter 46, we're going to get the template for the vision, right? The morale. We're going to get a template for the reflection, right? We're going to get a template for the looking glass, right? And so let's see what God says in Genesis chapter 46. Genesis chapter 46, verse 1. And let's break this down, Holy Spirit, so that we could all be in agreement with you in Jesus name. Amen. Genesis chapter 46 verse one. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father, Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of you a great nation. I will go down with you into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Hallelujah. So that's the template. Mm. This is the template, child of God. <laughs> right? This is the first time that Marah is mentioned. And it's mentioned in connection with God giving a looking glass, a reflection, a vision, a morale to Jacob in the night about what he is to do. Right. And God says he is to go down into Egypt because in Egypt, he's going to make of Jacob, Israel, a great nation. Mm. And so look at the typology. Mm. Look at the typology. All right. Look at the typology. So what has happened up until this point, right? This is the typology. So Holy Spirit, make this real to your people. This is, this is the typology that is going to set the stage for this template, right? So we know that Joseph is already down in Egypt and Joseph is a what? He's a type of Christ, right? He's a type of Christ. So what happened with Israel? What happened with Jacob? Jacob thought that his son had died, right? Jacob had thought that his son had died. Right. So Joseph represents Jesus Christ in so many different ways. Right. He's a type of Jesus Christ. So. As Jacob learns that Joseph is really alive. This represents the resurrection. Right. This represents the resurrection. Right. And what happens. Because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, he says that we have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. So everybody that wants to live forever, they have to go to Joseph, right? They have to go to Jesus, right? That's why Israel is on his way to see his son. He has to eat the bread because there's a literal famine going on, right? There's a famine. And the only one who has bread is Joseph and he's in Egypt, right? So Joseph represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ at this moment in time. Mm. 
Right. We're painting the picture of the vision of God. Amen. This is the vision of God. This is the template. All right. So this represents the church age right now. This is the church age. Hallelujah. This is the church age. Mm. Right. And everybody has to come to Jesus. We have to eat his flesh and drink his blood if we want to live forever. Mm. Just like jo uh, uh, Joseph, as a type of Christ, he has the bread of life, and everybody has to come to him if they want to live. Mm. So Jacob and his family, they go down into Egypt, right? They go down into Egypt. But the template continues because what happens? <laughs> what happens? Right? What happens when Israel is in Egypt? Well, God said in verse 3 that he's going to make of Jacob, right, called Israel, a great nation. Mm. Well, what's been happening for the last 2,000 years, even though Israel has gone through so much, right, tribulation, but the worst is yet to come, they're still a great nation, especially now because they've been reinstituted as a nation on May 14th, 1948, right, after being in exile, right, Egypt, right, Egypt is a type of the world, They've been in exile, right, amongst the Gentiles, right? But yet, God has preserved them because he has made them into a great nation. Mm. <laughs> right? And how about for the Gentiles? Well, the Gentiles, the Bible tells us about Joseph, right? Just think of, you know, when Jesus Christ went back to heaven, right? And for the last 2,000 years, he's, he's been sending out his emissaries, right? people that believe, but most of, you know, the world, right, they're still, you know, godless. They don't want Jesus Christ. And so just like the story that we read about in Exodus, what happened? Well, there came a king in Egypt who knew not Joseph, right? There came a king who knew not Joseph. And so what happened? The Gentiles, you know, uh, many of the Gentiles, they don't know Jesus, Right. They don't know Jesus. They don't want Jesus. Right. They want Charles Darwin. They want Buddha. They want Muhammad. Right. They want Sun Young Moon. Right? They want Charles Taze Russell. They want Joseph Smith. Right. They want to worship tarot cards. Right. They want uh, Alistair Crawley. Right. They want the Baphomet. OK. They want everything and everyone except the son of man. Hmm. Because there arose a king who knew not Joseph. Mm. Right. The whole world right, is antichrist. Mm. But there's a remnant. Amen. We're still here. <laughs> We're still here. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. Amen. We, may, we may have Elijah complexes uh, at various moments because, uh, Lord, is there anybody else? <laughs> Sometimes it seems like. Is there anybody else that stands for righteousness? You know, is there anybody else? Because sometimes it just seems like, hey, well, there ain't nobody else. But praise be to God, we know that there's a lot of people, amen, that still name the name of Christ and believe on him for everlasting life. Hallelujah. And so we're painting the picture of the visions of God. This is the template, right? Talking about the types and shadows. Mm, right? And so... What happens? Well, Ezekiel talks about this, right? As well as what God revealed to Abraham. He said he was going to have a nation go down into Egypt for 400 years. Mm, right? Well, Ezekiel portrays this in his visions, right? Uh, when, he acted out, when he acted out various aspects, he acted this out in Ezekiel. Uh, chapter 3, I mean, Ezekiel chapter 4, forgive me. Remember when God told him right, that he had to lie, right? Meaning lay down, right? He had to lie on his left side for the iniquity of the house of Israel, right? According to the number of days that God told him to lie down on his left side for their iniquity, which was 390 days, which represented 390 years. Mm. Right. And then when he was done with lying on his left side for 390 days, God says to roll over and, uh, and lie again on his right side so that he could bear the iniquity of the house of Judah for 40 days because God had appointed each day for a year. Mm. 
So this is the typology that we're looking at, right? The 390 days that Ezekiel was portraying, amen, represents the church age. It represents the time that we're in right now. Right? It represents the time that we're in right now. It corresponds to this type and shadow that we're looking at with this template for the visions of God beginning in Genesis chapter 46, where Jacob is told to go down into Egypt. We know that they were there for 400 years. That's what God told Abraham. Hmm. With the ultimate fulfillment, this is the time that we're in right now. Hmm. This is the time that we're in right now, the church age. Right? The church age. Hallelujah. This is the church age because God has a program. Hmm. God has a program right now where you can trade in your defiled bread right, for the bread of life. Right? And when you trade in your defiled bread for the bread of life, right, you come to Joseph, you come to Jesus, right? you eat of his body, you drink of his blood, you receive what? Oil. Right? The numerical value for oil in the Hebrew, which is the Hebrew word shemen, which is shin, mem, noon. Shin is 300, mem is 40, noon is 50, 390. It's the great exchange, right? We come to Jesus. All of our iniquity is placed upon him. And what happens? He imputes his righteousness unto us. It's the greatest exchange in all of human history, right? Ezekiel portrayed this, right? He laid on his left side for the iniquity of the house of Israel for 390 days. That same number, 390, is the same number for oil. So God has an exchange program going on. This is all uh, the deep things of God. Amen. As we diligently seek him to show ourselves approved as work men and women of God. Right. Because as you continue to read in Ezekiel chapter four. God says that the Gentiles are mixed in among the house of Israel eating defiled bread. Mm. Right. We see this in verse 13. <laughs> and the Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I shall drive them. So as Ezekiel is on his left side for the 390 days for the iniquity of the house of Israel, he is allowed to eat bread, right, which is defiled. Right? <laughs> and this defiled bread is eaten amongst the Gentiles. Right? But there is an exchange program that God has where you could exchange your defiled bread, whether you're a Gentile or you're of the house of Israel because there's neither Jew nor Gentile in Christ Jesus, because we are all one. There's an exchange program where you could trade in your defiled bread during the 390 and receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, the oil 390, and you will be saved. Mm. Same thing that's happening in this typology that we're looking at, right? In this typology that we're painting that happened in Genesis, right? There arose a king who knew not Joseph, right? Jesus Christ has went back to heaven, right? The world, Egypt, doesn't know Jesus Christ, right? And they hate it. And the world, the flesh, the devil, they hate the people of God, right? <laughs> but there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And so what, what, what's happening in the typology? Well, there's going to come a point where the deliverer appears, mm. When the deliverer appears, that's the son of man, that's the rapture. Who was the deliverer? It was Moses, right? Moses appeared, right? And what did Moses do when he appeared? He's a type of Christ. We're talking about the type and shadows. We're painting a picture. It's a beautiful picture. What happened when the deliverer appeared? Well, he saw two people fighting. He saw, he saw two people fighting and he tried to stand in the gap, right? And he slew the Egyptian to save Israel. What is Jesus Christ going to do when he appears on the clouds? He's going to save Israel. Right? He's not going to destroy everybody, not yet. <laughs> right? When he appears on the clouds, there's going to be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Mm. Right? The deliverer appeared. Moses appeared. Right? But the children of Israel, they weren't ready to be delivered yet. Why? Because they didn't recognize the deliverer. Mm. <laughs> right? They didn't recognize the deliverer. Just like in this story of Ezekiel chapter 4, after the 390 days are over. Mm. Right? That's when the deliverer appears 
type and shadow. We're talking about Moses in Genesis and Exodus, painting this picture of the visions of God, right? And so what happens in Ezekiel chapter 4, Ezekiel has to roll over for, on his right side for 40 days now. <laughs> and when Ezekiel rolls over on his right side for 40 days, well, there's no more bread. Mm. It's the time of trouble. It's the time of testing, right? And it's for the iniquity of the house of Judah. So what happened in the story of Moses, right? Moses stood up for the children of Israel, cloudy and dark day. God, Jesus Christ stands up, right? The prophet that Moses prophesied about that the people had to listen to. But if they didn't listen to him, well, great trouble was going to come upon them. Mm. Deuteronomy chapter 18, a prophet like unto myself shall God raise up. And we have to listen to that prophet. His name is Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ stands up and he speaks and you're not listening, well, you're left behind. Mm. What happened? Moses, right? He wasn't accepted as the deliverer and he flees to the wilderness for 40 years. Mm. And as he flees to the wilderness for 40 years, what happens? He marries a Gentile bride, rapture. <laughs> right, this is the typology, child of God. Right? This is the typology. You've got a robust understanding of the scriptures. You know these things to be true. Right? The deliverer is rejected when he stands up and he, slew, and he slays the Egyptian. Think of the dark and cloudy day. Jesus Christ stands up. He fights on Israel's behalf. Right? Gog and Magog. Isaiah 17, Elam, destruction of Babylon the Great, this world system. He fights on that day. He doesn't kill everybody, though. No, only one fourth. Mm. Hell horse, get out that gate. Right? When Moses stood up, he didn't destroy everybody. He destroyed an Egyptian, no. Okay? Everybody's not slain yet. Uh-uh. Okay, it's the rapture. Mm. And what happens? The deliverer is rejected by his people. Mm. Right. The deliverer is rejected by his people. Moses is rejected by his people. So what happens? He goes to the father's house. Hallelujah. <laughs> he goes to the priest of Midian. Ah, look at it. <laughs> you see, there's a priesthood far superior than the priesthood of Levi. Mm. Right. There's a priesthood that predates the Levitical priesthood. Right. <laughs> because the Levitical priesthood wasn't even set up yet. Mm. Right. When Moses fled to the father's house, there was a priest of Midian called Jethro. Uh oh. <laughs> right. Because we have a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Mm. There's a priesthood that is far superior to the Levitical priesthood because it is before the Levitical priesthood. Moses flees to the father's house and the father's house, there's a priest of Midian called Jethro. Hallelujah. This is all type and shadow. <laughs> right, we're talking about the visions of God, amen. And so what happens? The priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, our faithful high priest, mm. Right, who's superior to the Levitical priesthood that wasn't even set up yet. <laughs> right, it wasn't even set up yet. Amen. <laughs> what happens? He marries a Gentile bride. Amen. That's the rapture. Father's house, rapture. When Moses marries a Gentile bride in the father's house, right? When Moses marries a Gentile bride in the father's house, right? That's the rapture. After he stands up and he slays the Egyptian, right? Cloudy and dark day. There's a marriage that he is going to have to a Gentile bride in the father's house because his priesthood is far superior to the Levitical priesthood because he has an everlasting priesthood. In the father's house, represented by Jethro, the priest of Midian, that priesthood predated. It was before the Levitical priesthood was ever set up. Mm. And the Gentile bride is under the Melchizedekian priesthood, okay? And we are a kingdom of priests. There's a marriage going on for the 40. Hallelujah. You see, because how long was Moses gone? <laughs> Moses was gone, right, to the father's house for 40 years, mm, the time of testing, right? He was gone the same time <laughs> that Ezekiel was on his right side for 40 days. 
Israel's left behind. Mm -hmm. Right? Still under the lash of Pharaoh, Antichrist. Right? Still under the lash of Pharaoh building bricks. Right? <laughs> Still under the lash of Pharaoh during the time of testing, during the time of Jacob's trouble, they rejected the deliverer. Mm. They rejected the Holy One of Israel. Mm. They rejected the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Oh my goodness. Mm. But what happens? <laughs> after the 40 days are up, after the 40 years are up, well, here comes the second coming. Amen. <laughs> okay. Here comes the second coming. Amen. And what happens at the second coming? Well, <laughs> Egypt is destroyed. The world is destroyed. Amen. Right. And the children of Israel inherit the promised land. Amen. All type and shadow. That was just a template. Right? That was just a template to show you the visions of God, what we're looking at. Remember? We're looking at the first mention of vision in the Bible based upon Genesis chapter 46. God has given us a robust picture of the visions of God because you have a robust understanding of the full counsel of God. Amen. And therefore, you can see these things because the Holy Spirit is taking the things of Christ and making them real to you. Right? Because you know what thus saith the Lord. The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Better prophesy, child of God. Okay. Better stand upon your watchtower and declare what thus saith the Lord. The lion hath roared. Who will but fear? Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know these things to be true, child of God. <laughs> and so that's the template. Mm. That's the template, amen. That's the template of what's going to happen, amen. What's the second mention of the Mara? Remember, Mara is vision, amen. Mara is vision. It's a looking glass. It's a mirror. It's a reflection. The whole premise is set up with Genesis chapter 46, Amen. And we just broke it down through the power of the Holy Spirit to give you the framework, the template, based upon everything that we know to be true because we have the full counsel of God. But the vision continues because God is going to get into the details now. Right? He's going to give you the details. He gave you the basic framework, right, with Genesis chapter 46. Amen. But now he's going to get into the details of what's going to happen. Mm. Exodus 38 verse 8 is the next time that we come across this word for vision, which is Mara. Mm. And it comes in connection with the making of the bronze basin. Right? What bronze basin is this? <laughs> well, this is the laver, right, for washings. Mm. Right? This is the brass laver for washings. This this item right here. Right? This is the laver. Right? This is what he's describing next. So the second mention mm, of this word Mara comes in connection with the laver for washing. Well, this is interesting, right? Let's read it, because what, is, what does God say about this laver, right? Well, this is when Moses was told to make everything according to the pattern that was shown him on the mountain. And so one of the things that God showed him was this laver for washings, right? Exodus 38, verse 8, And he made the laver of brass, and the foot of it brass, of the looking glasses of women assembling, which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. <laughs> right? Remember, this Hebrew word, mara, right, is a looking glass. It's a mirror. Right? That's what a vision is. Amen. So here it goes, looking glasses. Right? Vision, a mirror, a looking glass. So the second mention of the mara is in connection with the labor for washing. Well, what did we just go over? Right? We just went over, according to Genesis chapter 46, right? we went over the template and we know that there's going to be a rapture. Right? And when the rapture takes place, right? when Ezekiel rolls over to his right side, mm, right? when the 390 for the 390 is over, mm, right? when Moses is rejected as the deliverer, mm, well, he goes to the father's house <laughs> Jethro, the priest of Midian, because the priesthood of Melchizedek precedes, right, 
and is far superior to the Levitical priesthood, and he marries a Gentile bride mm, in the father's house. Amen. <laughs> and when we're here, right, this is the father's house. When we're inside the father's house, well, what are we standing on? We're standing on the looking glass. My goodness. Mm. When we go to the father's house, what well, we standing on, child of God. <laughs> When we go to the Father's house, I'm talking about the Father's house. Amen. What we standing on, child of God? Come on now. What we standing on? Amen. We we seeing visions of God. Do you want to see visions of God? Well, hey, praise King Jesus. He's showing us visions of God. Amen. <laughs> Revelation chapter four, right? When the door to heaven is open, right? When those who've accepted the deliverer are taken up in the clouds, caught up, harpazo, raptured. Right. When we go through the open door. Right. When those who are in Christ are separated from those who are not in Christ. Right. When the whirlwind of separation appears. Amen. All of us who are caught up in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. We go through the open door. And what are we standing on? Mm. What are we standing on, child of God? Mm. Revelation chapter four, verse six. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Amen. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Amen. <laughs> it's right here, the labor. We're standing on the looking glass. Amen. <laughs> right now, we see through a mirror dimly. <laughs> right now, we see through a mirror dimly. Okay. We see through a mirror dimly. We, we get the types, we get the shadows, right? We get the templates, we get the visions of God. Okay, but on the day of separation, on the day when it's no longer the reflection, right? We're going to be standing face to face. And when we stand face to face, we're going to be standing on the looking glass. Amen. <laughs> we're going to be standing on the sea of glass. Amen. We're going to be standing before the throne praising King Jesus because he has given us the victory. Amen. We've accepted the deliverer, right? We've accepted the deliverer. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, this labor represents the sea of glass that separates our world from God's world, right? <laughs> I mean, everything belongs to him, amen, but his domain, which is the third heaven, right? He's the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, right? So in this tabernacle model, the labor for washings represents the barrier, right, that separates this created universe from where God sits, right, his house, amen. But when the door to heaven is open, amen, Everybody that accepted the deliverer when he stands up, right? <laughs> when he stands up to slay the Egyptian, he ain't gonna kill, he ain't gonna kill everybody. Uh-uh, not yet. He ain't gonna kill everybody, not yet. Mm -mm. But there's gonna be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Mm. Right. Everybody who is caught up on that day when he comes like lightning from east to west. Amen. We go into the house and we're standing on the labor. We're standing on the looking glass. We're standing on the sea of glass. Amen. Right. You just stack these up. Right. You stack these up one on top of another. Right. This is the third heaven. Right. Where God dwells. Right. This is the separation between the third heaven and the created universe. This is the floor. Right. The labor. This is the looking glass. We're standing on top of it. And then here goes the earth, the altar of burnt offerings. This represents the earth. Amen. So there's going to be people taken above and there's going to be people left behind. Right. God is going to call everybody who has light unto himself because God is light. And when he does that. He calls the light good because Christ is in us and he's the only one who's good. But the darkness is under his feet. Woe worth the day. Because God is going to separate the waters above, everybody who has the incorruptible seed, from the waters below. Right? 
waters below, they're still on the, they're still on the earth. They're, there's a sacrifice that God has on this day, right? And God has bid his guest, right? You don't want to enter into the new covenant in his blood, right? You didn't want to be gathered as a saint into the father's house, right? You rejected the deliverer. So guess what? You're not going to be part of the marriage, okay? So now you're left behind on the earth and you're under the looking glass, okay? And you talk about, you talk about dark and cloudy, okay? Look what happens, look what happens, right? As the tribulation rolls on, right? As for, at first, when we get caught up, amen, and we're before the throne, right? The sea of glass is like under crystal, okay? But you go further and further into the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, now look what the sea of glass looks like. Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Mm. So now the sea of glass is mingled with fire, <laughs> right? Now the sea of glass is mingled with fire right before the seven bowls of wrath are about to be poured out, right? Because great judgment has fell upon the altar of burnt offering, right? Great judgment has been poured out already, right? And so now it's about to be the final seven bowls and woe worth the day, okay? <clears throat> right? we, have to, we have to tail in when it gets to that point, amen? Right, when the sea of glass is mingled with fire, uh-oh. Right, when the sea of glass mingled with fire, uh-oh, Antichrist, false prophet, ooh, your time is short. Mm. Uh-oh, all you people who took the mark of the beast, ooh, your time is short. You talk about short. <laughs> Amen. Can't wait. Hallelujah. <laughs> Can't wait. Amen. And so we're, we're seeing... What's going to happen? Amen. Remember, we're looking at this Hebrew word for vision, mara, right? We got the template in Genesis chapter 46, right? On into Exodus. And then in Exodus 38, verse 8, we saw where we are going to stand, right? We're going to be standing on the laver, right? We're going to be standing, right, on the sea of glass when we are caught up. Mm. Third mention of mara comes in Numbers chapter 12. Well, what's going to happen to the people who are left behind? <laughs> what's happening to the people on the earth, right? Under the labor, right? What's happening to the people under the labor, right? Under the labor is right here, right? If you're under the labor, you're right here, okay? You're on the earth. You're under the labor. You've been left behind. So according to the visions of God, right? Mara, this vision, this looking glass, what is God showing us with Numbers chapter 12? Well, look what God says, right? The children of Israel are complaining about the marriage. Mm. Right. A lot of jealousy. Ooh. We have provoked the children of Israel to jealousy. Mm. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? <laughs> we have provoked the children of Israel to jealousy. Mm. The children of Israel are jealous. Mm. The children of Israel are jealous of the Gentile bride. Mm. The children of Israel are like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. Mm. Right. The prodigal son has come home Amen. Mm. because the last has to be first. Right. He was the last born, so he has to be first. Amen. Mm. Right. But the eldest, right? <laughs> The eldest, the older brother, right? He he's first, so now he has to be last. Mm. Right. And so what happens, right? The marriage is taking place, right? The prodigal son has come home. Okay. They're singing and dancing. The door is shut. Okay. And so now the older brother, he's hot. Oh, he's hot. Okay. <laughs> He's hot. Ooh, he's hot. He on the altar of burnt offerings. Ooh, he hot. He hot. Okay. He under the looking glass. Okay. He under it now. Mm. He under it and he's hot. Ooh, he's still complaining. Mm. You ain't never killed for me, no fatty calf. Ooh, he complaining. He hot. 
But the Bible says that God hates complaining. Mm. Amen. <laughs> and so what happens? Here goes Miriam and Aaron complaining about the marriage. Right. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. <laughs> right. So the children of Israel, they're left behind, right? They rejected the deliverer, right? And not only have they rejected the deliverer, right? They've also rejected the bride of the deliverer, right? They are jealous of the bride of the deliverer. Right? She's an Egyptian, right? She's an Ethiopian, mm. right? <laughs> She's a Goyim, okay? How can we worship Yeshua HaMashiach? He's married a Goyim. Mm. Right. He's married a Goyim. Oh, he's married a Goyim. <laughs> right. He's married a Goyim. We will not worship Yeshua HaMashiach. Those left behind, cloudy and dark day. He's married a Goyim. <laughs> okay. And so what happens in their complaint? They rejected the deliverer. They rejected the bride of the deliverer. So what does God say? <laughs> Shut them outside the camp for how long? Seven days. All right, let's read it though. <laughs> seven days equals the seven year tribulation. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam. Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. There it goes. There goes the marah, right? That's the Hebrew word right there, vision, right? So God is going to make himself known in a marah. <laughs> if there's a prophet among us. Amen. Well, guess what? All of us who are accepting of the deliverer, we have the incorruptible seed. We have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. And so God has made his vision known unto us. We know the Marah. We see the reflection. We have understanding because the Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and makes them real to us. And therefore, we can't be hoodwinked, bamboos, or led astray. Jesus Christ leads and guides us into all truth through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh. But the question is, do you know him? Mm. I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. We don't reject the vision. We say yes to the vision. Mm. We don't reject the looking glass. We say, Lord Jesus, let me see in the looking glass. Mm. <laughs> we say, Holy Spirit, teach me great and mighty things that I do not know. Open up my eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word. I'm calling upon you, Jesus. Amen. Right? We got boldness to enter into the Father's house. We can come boldly before his throne. Amen. With holy reverential fear, bowing our knees in worship and saying, King Jesus, you live forever. Can I sit at your feet? Ooh, can I sit at your feet? Mm. Lord Jesus, just want to sit at your feet. Mm. You got all these people around here. Talk about ain't no pre-tribulation rapture. They want to sit in the seat of Moses, teaching things that they ought not to teach because they have no understanding of the things of Moses. Right? They want to rob God of his glory. Mm. And God says, I share my glory with no one. Can you imagine these people? Right? Can you imagine these people? They want to rob God of his glory saying he will not be glorified in his saints at the pre-tribulation rapture. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I know that. I just, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to be, I don't know. That's just me though. Amen. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I'm not saying that these people, right, teaching these things, right, are lost. I'm not saying that. Amen. I just wouldn't want to be in their shoes. <laughs> Right, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes teaching these type of things because Jesus Christ says, be not ye many teachers. I mean, because salvation is dependent upon the gospel, 
Amen. Because of his amazing grace and our response in faith, which was already predestined before the foundations of the world. Amen. And because God chose us, we didn't choose him. Amen. And because he first loved us, we love him. Amen. It's a love relationship that's we respond as a bride in faith. Right. He is our husband. He is our bridegroom and the bridegroom leads and the bride, the woman. Right. <clears throat> is to respond to the husband. Right. We follow his lead. Amen. And because he has us by the hands, we're in his hands. We can never be separated no matter what. If you've been born again, receiving the incorruptible seed. But then again, God says that there's sheep. Right. <laughs> that are really wolves. Mm. Because they got on cosplay costumes. <laughs> They're dressed up as sheep, but inwardly, ooh, they ravenous wolves. Right. They talk to Christian knees. Okay. But when I get out my Rosetta Stone, we'll get it out now. I crack open the Rosetta Stone. Ooh, let me let me examine your Christian knees. Let me examine it now. Okay. Ooh, I got my Rosetta Stone. Ooh, I got my Rosetta Stone. And you know what? My Rosetta Stone, oh, it got seven eyes. The stone which the builders rejected. Let me, let me check out your Christian knees. Okay. God told me that there will be tears amongst the wheat. I got to check out your Christian knees. I got to run it through my Rosetta Stone. Got to run it by the King of Glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and so, hey. <laughs> If you say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, praise be to God. But if you're over here teaching stuff about eschatology, and I know that your Christianese in regards to eschatology don't pass the smell test, some in the milk ain't clean. Well, hey, I'm not coming to your fountain. Uh -uh. Okay. I ain't coming to your fountain. No way. Okay. I ain't coming to your fountain. Okay. Because your fountain over there, ooh, whole bunch of rotten eggs over there. Uh uh. Whole bunch of rotten eggs. Okay. Whole bunch of rotten eggs. Mm. I refuse, by the power of Jesus Christ, to be hoodwinked, bamboozled, or led astray. So help me God. Amen. I refuse. I refuse <laughs> because what that tells me, <laughs> because your eggs over there all stinky, right? You're over there stinking up the joint, right? You're stinking up the joint and you over here serving out dishes full of foolishness to other people who are deceived by your foolishness. And I don't want to have any part with that foolishness, deceitfully handling the word of God denying God of his glory. Can you imagine the audacity? Okay. That's one, I ain't saying they ain't saved, Amen. but I know what the Bible says. Okay, there, there, there's tares amongst the wheat and there's sheep in cosplay. <laughs> and the first thing that God told me, you want to talk about eschatology 101, <laughs> eschatology 101, what was the first lesson? Mm. Eschatology 101, first lesson. Matthew 24, amen. <laughs> amen. We're going to talk just a little bit. We're going to talk just a little bit, child of God. Mm. First lesson, eschatology 101. Mm. Matthew 24, verse 3. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Mm. First lesson by the Master. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many by the blood of the Lamb of God. So help me, King Jesus. I plead the blood, amen. <laughs> I plead the blood of the sinless Lamb of God. I plead it. 
By the grace and mercy of Almighty God, I plead the blood before his glorious high throne, whose foundation is justice and truth. I plead the blood. Mm. I have not rejected the deliverer because he first loved me. Mm. He chose me. I didn't choose him. Mm. And he said to me, James Smith, live. I said, yes. I'm a pop. What else can I say? Jesus Christ said to James Smith, live. I said, yes. Hallelujah. What can I say? I'm a pop. Mm. Praise God. He said, James Smith, a vessel of honor. Mm. James Smith, for the foundation of the world, vessel of honor. What else can I say? Praise King Jesus. And so when I go to the Rosetta Stone, I'm going to go to the Rosetta Stone. Okay. When I go to the Rosetta Stone, hear all this Christianese. Let me get, let me get some interpretation. Mm. Let me get some interpretation for all your tongue twisting. Okay. <laughs> let me get some interpretation for all your tongue twisting. Eschatology 101, Matthew 24, 4, Matthew 24, 5. That's it. That's all. Amen. <laughs> God is good. Amen. God is good. Amen. And so numbers, right? We, 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 we're still on track. We're still on track. Numbers chapter 12, right? We're still talking about the visions of God. We're still talking about the morale. Right? We're still talking about what God is showing us, those of us who belong to him and have an understanding of who he is through the power of the Holy Spirit and what he's going to do before he does it because we let God be true and every man a liar. We see that God says that when he makes himself known to a prophet, he makes himself known to a prophet in a vision. Mm. Because we have the testimony of Jesus Christ and the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy we have the incorruptible seed in us, the Holy Spirit, making everything real to us as we study the visions. Mm. Right? We study the visions. Right? <laughs> and we don't reject the visions. We don't reject the Word of God. We know that every Word of God is profitable. Right? We know that every Word of God is God-breathed. We know that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit, the anointing that is in us, that overflows, that we can understand all things because he takes the things of Christ and makes them real to us. And so we call upon him. We plead the blood so that we cannot be deceived, hoodwinked, or bamboozled. Praise King Jesus. And so here we see the type and shadow. Right? We see the type and shadow. Israel, represented by Miriam and Aaron, Israel represented by Miriam and and Aaron, okay? Type and shadow, the prodigal of the, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, right? Prodigal son being us, the church, right? The last that becomes first, right? The prodigal son being the Ethiopian woman, right? <laughs> the prodigal son being the bride that Moses took in the father's house, right? When he appeared as the deliverer, but... Israel rejected him and they got left behind in the 44 to 40. And so what happens as they're left behind in the 44 to 40, more revelation about the type and shadow, the template of what's going to take place during the time of Jacob's trouble, right? Israel is complaining, represented by Miriam and Aaron, about the marriage. Yeshua married a Goyim. Mm. How dare he? Mm. Yeshua married a Goyim. How dare he? Mm. Right? They've been left behind. Mm. You talk about a fog over their eyes. Well, hey, it's the dark and cloudy day. Mm. And so what's God, what is God's judgment for the dark and cloudy day because they rejected the Messiah? 
They rejected the deliverer. They rejected the bride of the deliverer. Well, God says, shut out Miriam for seven days, right? Seven year tribulation. Mm. Why? Because Miriam is leprous, right? She receives a judgment of leprosy. Leprosy represents uncleanness. Everybody left behind is unclean, right? Everybody left behind is dead in their trespasses and sins. They're unclean, right? And so they all been left behind for the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven year tribulation, right? Numbers chapter 12, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days. And after that, let her be received in again. Seven year tribulation. Right? So this uncleanness lasts for seven years, corresponding to the time when Ezekiel rose over for the 40 days on his right side for the iniquity of the house of Judah. Right? The marriage has taken place inside the father's house during this 40 for the 40. Amen. This 40, number 40, represents a time of testing. We know that this time of testing is seven years. Right? The seven year tribulation, the worst time in all of human history. Everybody's been left behind under God's feet, under the looking glass, and everybody is unclean, shut out for seven days. Right? But God in his mercy, amen, God in his mercy, He's going to have a plan of redemption during the seven year tribulation, right? Right, and we read about that in the book of Revelation. But before I get ahead of myself, let's go to the fourth mention, amen? Let's go to the fourth mention of this Hebrew word mara, which is vision, amen? The fourth mention we find in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 15 in the story of Samuel. Well, what's this all about? Right. What's, what's this all about? First Samuel chapter three is when the Lord called Samuel, right? The Lord called Samuel and the Lord revealed, right? In a vision to Samuel, what he was going to do to the priesthood of Eli and his sons that defiled the priesthood, right? You read about this here in first Samuel chapter three. <laughs> he says this in verse 11, Lord speaking to Samuel, and the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. <laughs> He's going to do a thing in Israel. Amen. He's going to do a thing in Israel. This is all a vision of what's going to take place at the time of the end. Amen. It literally happened in Samuel's day, but of course, we're talking about visions. We're talking about prophecies. We're talking about prophets. We're talking about a looking glass of God. We're talking about the living God who speaks yesterday, today, and forever. Right? We're talking about the living word of God that's sharper than any two-edged sword. Right? We're talking about God's word that is forever settled in heaven, that has words that are applicable to us today if we let the Holy Spirit teach us great and mighty things that we do not know. God is going to do a thing at the time of the end concerning the house of Israel, specifically targeted toward the priesthood, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it, it shall tingle. Okay. Woo! Ring, ding, dong, ring, a ding, 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 dong. Keep the ears ringing. Woo! That ears gonna tingle. Dark and cloudy day. In that day, I will perform against Eli all the things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. Okay. <laughs> right? When this all begins, woo! Now you know. He gonna make an end. And guess what? You're under his feet. Now you know. There's one thing you know under his feet. Ooh, your ears, they gonna tingle. Okay. God is gonna do a thing in Israel <laughs> at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it, it shall tingle. Know that. Okay. <laughs> For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Mm. This is an eternal judgment. Right? This is an eternal judgment of everybody right, <laughs> that fails to fall in line 
right, with the new covenant in Christ Jesus' blood, right, represented by the sons of Eli who were wicked. And God says that there is no sacrifice or offering that will ever pardon their iniquity, a.k.a. time of Jacob's trouble. If you take the mark of the beast, <laughs> right, if you take it in your forehead or in your hand, worship in his image, bowing down to his feet, there will never be any sacrifice or offering which will be able to redeem you. Okay. God is going to do a thing in Israel <laughs> at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Dark and cloudy day. <laughs> right. And Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. There it goes. <laughs> right? The vision was fulfilled in his day. Okay? <laughs> the sons of Eli, including Eli himself, died, just like God said would happen. Right? The ark of God was captured right? and went to the land of the Philistines. And the ears of Israel tingled when this all happened. Right? But the ultimate fulfillment is during the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? And the priesthood is going to be judged. Right? They want to live by the law. Right? They will be judged by the law. But they won't be redeemed by the law. Mm -mm. Right? There's no redemption right, found in the keeping of the law. No. The lawgiver, Jesus Christ, has already come to redeem those who are under the law. But they said no to the deliverer. Right? That's why they missed the rapture. And so now they got to deal with the corrupted priesthood. Now here comes the Antichrist and the false prophet. Take the mark of the beast, 666. Okay. Here comes the corrupted priesthood. Mm. Here comes the ultimate sons of Eli. Okay. The Antichrist and the false prophet. Ooh, here they come. You talk about a corrupted priesthood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's so much I want to talk about, child of God, but I'm already an hour and 30 minutes in. Amen. I'm already an hour and 30 minutes in, and we only went over the first four. So I'm going to pick up, the Lord says the same, and we're going to do these last um, six, beginning with Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. And then Ezekiel 8, 3, Ezekiel 42, Ezekiel 43, 3, Daniel 10, 7, and Daniel 10, 8. I got, I got, some, I got some nuggets to show you, though. Amen. I got some nuggets to show you because I don't want to rush it. Amen. I don't want to rush it and, and be speaking uh, through these last mentions because I want to show you some nuggets. Amen. So I pray that your, your palate, right, was wet with the word of God and that you tasted and you seen that the Lord is good and you have devoured the honeycomb, which is sweeter. Uh, because it's the word of God which blesses and nourishes our soul. And I pray that you were built up in the faith and you got an understanding of the visions of God. Amen. Just a little bit. I pray that you understood the template that God gave in Isaiah 46 and saw in, his, in Exodus 38 the place that we're going to be standing upon and the separation from those above, from those under. And we saw why Israel is left behind in Numbers chapter 12 because they're complaining. They reject not only the deliverer, but they also reject the bride of the deliverer, right? They reject the church and they can't believe that Yeshua HaMashiach has married a Goyim. <laughs> and then we see that God is going to pour out, right, his judgment upon a corrupted priesthood. And everybody that's left behind, their ears are going to tingle when this all comes about. Amen. Because here comes the Antichrist and the false prophet. Amen. <laughs> And so we're going to pick up, if the Lord says the same, uh, with the next teaching. Amen. So I pray that you are blessed. Please keep me in your prayers. I love you, family of God, and I pray God's protection around you at all times. May we always be watching and praying so that we can be accounted worthy to escape all the things that are about to come on the earth and stand before King Jesus, the Son of Man. Because the revelation of the Son of Man is soon and very soon. For the days are at hand, and the fulfillment of every vision hastens. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Maranatha. Amen.